From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the 184th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church, and music for this session by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, First Counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the fourth session of the 184th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Thomas S. Monson, who presides at the conference, has asked that I conduct this session. We extend our greetings and warm regards to those of you who are participating in these proceedings throughout the world by radio, television, the inter internet, or satellite transmission. We acknowledge and welcome the general authorities and the general officers who are in attendance this morning. The music for this session will be by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Mac Wilberg with Richard Elliott and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir opened this session by singing, Come We That Love the Lord, and will now favor us with On This Day of Joy and Gladness. The invocation will then be offered by Elder L. Whitney Clayton of the Presidency of the Seventy.
Our beloved Heavenly Father, on this wonderful Sabbath day, we humbly come before Thee with hearts which are ready to be taught. We pray that Thy Spirit might attend us. We offer Thee willing hearts and open minds and ask Thee this day that Thou wouldst bless us, that our minds might be inspired, that our hearts might be touched. We pray for those who will sing, for those who will speak, and for all of us who will listen, that this day we might be strengthened in Thee, become more like Thy Son, Jesus Christ, and use this day to indeed become better servants and disciples. We thank Thee for the, for the privilege of being together this, this day, wherever we are across the world, and offer this prayer in humility and gratitude. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The choir will now sing, Let Us All Press On. After the music, we will be pleased to hear from President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, Second Counselor in the First Presidency. He will be followed by Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Sister Jean Stevens, First Counselor in the Primary General Presidency.
Thank you, choir. What a blessing you are for us and for all who <clears throat> listen and hear you. Over the years, I have had the sacred opportunity to meet with many people whose sorrows seem to reach the very depths of their soul. In these moments, I have listened to my beloved brothers and sisters and grieved with them over their burdens. I've pondered what to say to them, and I have struggled to know how to comfort and support them in their trials. Often their grief is caused by what seems to them as an ending. Some are facing the end of a cherished relationship, such as the death of a loved one or estrangement from a family member. Others feel they are facing the end of hope, the hope of being married or bearing children or overcoming an illness. Others may be facing the end of their faith as confusing and conflicting voices in the world tempt them to question, even abandon, what they once knew to be true. Sooner or later, I believe that all of us experience times when the very fabric of our world tears at the seams, leaving us feeling alone, frustrated, and adrift. It can happen to anyone, no one is immune. Everyone's situation is different, and the details of each life are unique. Nevertheless, I have learned that there is something that would take away the bitterness that may come into our lives. There's one thing we can do to make life sweeter, even joyful, and even glorious. We can be grateful. It might sound contrary to the wisdom of the world to suggest that one who is burdened with sorrow should give thanks to God. But those who set aside the bottle of bitterness and lift instead the goblet of gratitude can find a purifying drink of healing, peace, and understanding. As disciples of Christ, we are commanded to thank the Lord our God in all things, to sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving, and to let our heart be full of thanks unto God. Why does God command us to be grateful? All of His commandments are given to make blessings available to us. Commandments are opportunities to exercise our agency and to receive blessings. Our loving Heavenly Father knows that choosing to develop a spirit of gratitude will bring us true joy and great happiness. But some might say, what do I have to be grateful for when my world is falling apart? Perhaps focusing on what we are grateful for is the wrong approach. It is difficult to develop a spirit of gratitude if our thankfulness is only proportional to the number of blessings we can count. True, it is important to frequently count our blessings. And anyone who has tried this knows there are many. But I don't believe that the Lord expects us to be less thankful in times of trial than in times of abundance and ease. In fact, most of the scriptural references do not speak of gratitude for things, but rather suggest an overall spirit or attitude of gratitude. It is easy to be grateful for things when life seems to be going our way. But what then of those times when what we wish for seems to be far out of reach? Could I suggest that we see gratitude as a disposition, a way of life that stands independent of our current situation? 
In other words, I'm suggesting that instead of being thankful for things, we focus on being thankful in our circumstances, whatever they may be. There's an old story of a waiter who asked a customer whether he had enjoyed the meal. The guest replied that everything was fine, but it would have been better if they had served more bread. The next day, when the man returned, the waiter doubled the amount of bread, giving him four slices instead of two. But still, the man was not happy. The next day, the waiter doubled the bread again without success. On the fourth day, the waiter was really determined to make the man happy. And so he took a nine-foot-long loaf of bread, <laughs> cut it in half, and with a smile served that to the customer. The waiter could scarcely wait for the man's reaction. After the meal, the man looked up and said, good, as always, but I see you're back to giving only two slices of bread. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> the choice is ours. We can choose to limit our gratitude based on the blessings we feel we lack. Or we can choose to be like Nephi, whose grateful heart never faltered when his brothers tied him up on the ship which he had built to take them to the Promised Land. His ankles and wrists were so sore they had swollen exceedingly, and a violent storm threatened to swallow him up in the depth of the sea. Nevertheless, Nephi said, I did look unto my God, and I did praise him all the day long, and I did not murmur against the Lord because of mine afflictions. We can choose to be like Job, who seemed to have everything but then lost it all. Yet Job responded by saying, Naked I came out of the mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We can choose to be like the Mormon pioneers who maintained a spirit of gratitude during their slow and painful trek toward the Great Salt Lake. Even singing, and dancing and glorifying in the goodness of God. Many of us would have been inclined to withdraw, to complain, and to agonize about the difficulty of the journey. We can choose to be like the prophet Joseph Smith, who, while a prisoner in miserable conditions in Liberty Jail, penned these inspired words. Dearly beloved brethren, let us cheerfully do all things that lie in our power, and then may we stand still with the utmost assurance to see the salvation of God and for His arm to be revealed. We can choose to be grateful no matter what. This type of gratitude transcends whatever happening around us. It surpasses disappointment discouragement, and despair. It blooms just as beautifully in the icy landscape of winter as it does in the blessed warmth of summer. When we are grateful to God in our circumstances, we can experience gentle peace in the midst of tribulation, in grief, we can still lift up our hearts in praise. In pain, we can glory in Christ's atonement. In the cold of bitter sorrow, we can experience the closeness and warmth of heaven's embrace. We sometimes think that being grateful is what we do after our problems are solved. But how terribly short-sighted, that is. How much of life do we miss by waiting to see the rainbow before thanking God that there is rain? Being grateful in times of distress does not mean 
that we are pleased with our circumstances. It does mean that through the eyes of faith, we look beyond our present-day challenges. This is not a gratitude of the lips, but of the soul. It is a gratitude that heals the heart and expands the mind. Being grateful in our circumstances is an act of faith in God. It requires that we trust God and hope for things we may not see, but which are true. By being grateful, we follow the example of our beloved Savior who said, not my will, but thine be done. True, gratitude is an expression of hope and testimony. It comes from acknowledging that we do not always understand the trials of life, but trusting that one day we will. In any circumstance, our sense of gratitude is nourished by the many and sacred truth we do know that our Father has given His children the great plan of happiness, that through the atonement of His Son, Jesus Christ, we can live forever with our loved ones, that in the end we will have glorious, perfect, and immortal bodies unburdened by sickness or disability, and that our tears of sadness and loss will be replaced with an abundance of happiness and joy, good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. It must have been this kind of testimony that transformed the Savior's apostles from fearful, doubting men into fearless, joyful emissaries of the Master. In the hours following His crucifixion, they were consumed with despair and grief, unable to understand what has just happened. But one event changed all of that. Their Lord appeared to them and declared, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. When the apostles recognized the risen Christ, when they experienced the glorious resurrection of their beloved Savior, they became different men. Nothing could keep them from fulfilling their mission. They accepted with courage and determination the torture, humiliation, and even death that would come to them because of their testimony. They were not deterred from praising and serving their Lord. They changed the lives of people everywhere. They changed the world. You do not need to see the Savior as the apostles did to experience the same transformation. Your testimony of Christ, born of the Holy Ghost, can help you look past the disappointing endings in mortality and see the bright future that the Redeemer of the world has prepared. In light of what we know about our eternal destiny is it any wonder that whenever we face the bitter endings of life, they seem unacceptable to us? There seems to be something inside of us that resists endings. Why is this? Because we are made of the stuff of eternity. We are eternal beings, children of the Almighty God, whose name is endless and who promises eternal blessings without number. Endings are not our destiny. The more we learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more we realize that endings here in mortality are not endings at all. They are merely interruptions, temporary pauses that one day will seem small compared to the eternal joy awaiting the faithful. How grateful I am to my Heavenly Father that in His plan there are no true endings, only everlasting beginnings.
Brothers and sisters, have we not reason to be filled with gratitude, regardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves? Do we need any greater reason to let our hearts be full of thanks unto God? Have we not great reason to rejoice? How blessed we are if we recognize God's handiwork in the marvelous tapestry of life. Gratitude to our Father in heaven broadens our perception and clears our vision. It inspires humility and fosters empathy toward our fellow men and all of God's creation. Gratitude is a catalyst to all Christ-like attributes. A thankful heart is the parent of all virtues. The Lord has given us his promise that those who receive all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto them. May we live in thanksgiving daily, especially during the seemingly unexplainable endings that are part of mortality. May we allow our souls to expand in thankfulness toward our merciful Heavenly Father. May we ever and constantly raise our voices and show by word and deed our gratitude to our Father in Heaven and His beloved Son, even Jesus Christ. For this I pray and leave you my testimony and blessing in the sacred name of our Master, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Sixty-four years ago this September, I returned home from my mission in England. Three days after returning, I attended a Hello Day dance at the University of Utah with a friend of mine. He told me about a beautiful sophomore named Barbara Bowen, who he thought I ought to meet. He brought her over and introduced us, and we started to dance. Unfortunately, this was what we used to call a tag dance, which meant that you only got to dance with the girl until somebody else tagged you out. Barbara was vivacious and popular, so I only got to dance with her for less than a minute before another young man tagged me out. That was just not acceptable to me. <laughs> having, having learned the importance of follow-up on my mission, <laughs> I got her telephone number and called her the very next day to ask her out. But she was busy with school and social commitments. Thankfully, my mission taught me to be persistent, <laughs> even in the face of discouragement. And I was eventually able to make a date, and that date led to others. Somehow, during those dates, I was able to convince her that I was the only true and living returned missionary, <laughs> at least as far as she should be concerned. Now, 64 years later, there are seven children, many grandchildren and great-grandchildren, who stand as evidence of the significant truth that no matter how good your message is, you may not get a chance to deliver it without consistent, persistent follow-up. This may be why I have felt the, cl the clear impression to follow up today on two of my previous general conference messages. In October 2011 conference, I urged that we remember these important words of the Lord. For thus saith, thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With these words, the Lord makes clear that this is not only a formal title, but the name by which His Church is to be called. Giving His clear declaration, we should not refer to the Church by any other name, such as the Mormon Church or the LDS Church. 
The term Mormon can be appropriately used in some contexts to refer to members of the Church, such as Mormon pioneers or the institutions such as the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Church members are widely known as Mormons, and in interactions with those not of our faith, we may fittingly refer ourselves as Mormons, provided we couple this with the full name of the Church. If members learn to use the correct name of the Church in connection with the word Mormon, it will underscore that we are Christians, members of the Savior's Church. Brothers and sisters, let us follow up and develop the habit of always making it clear that we belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The second message that I feel I should follow up on was delivered just last General Conference when I encourage members to pray to be led to at least one person to whom they could extend an invitation to learn about the restored gospel before Christmas. Many Church members have shared with me some special experiences as a consequence of their asking the Lord for missionary opportunities. One return missionary, for example, specifically prayed to be led to the one who he could reach. The name of a former college classmate came into his mind. He reached out to her over Facebook, Facebook and he learned that she had been praying for purpose and meaning in her life. He followed up just at the time she was searching for the truth, and in December she was baptized. Many similar invitations were reported to me, but only a few have been followed up like this brother did. I am a great believer in the principle of follow-up. As it says in the missionary guide, Preach My Gospel, extending an invitation without following it up is like beginning a journey without finishing it, or buying a ticket to a concert without going to the theater. Without the completed action, the commitment is hollow. Preach My Gospel teaches everyone how to not only invite, but also how to follow up on invitations. The purpose of missionary work is defined as inviting others to come unto Christ by helping them receive the restored gospel through faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. Inviting is certainly part of the process. But notice that there is much more to missionary work for members than simply extending invitations to people to listen to the missionaries. It also includes follow-up with the missionaries in the cultivation of faith, the motivation to repentance, the preparation for making covenants, and enduring to the end. This follow-up principle is illustrated in the book of Acts. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to enter the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. That's a powerful invitation from a servant of the Lord, isn't it? But Peter didn't stop with the invitation. The scriptural narrative text 
tells us that he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping, stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. In other words, Peter didn't simply invoke his priesthood authority and invite the man to rise up and walk. He also followed up on his invitation by reaching out to the man, taking him by the right hand and lifting him up, and then walking with him into the temple. In the spirit of Peter's example, may I suggest that we can all be more consistently involved in missionary work by replacing our fear with real faith, inviting someone at least once a quarter or four times every year to be taught by the full-time missionaries. They are prepared to teach by the Spirit with sincere and heartfelt inspiration from the Lord. Together we can follow up our invitations, take others by the hand, lift them up, and walk with them on their spiritual journey. To help you in this process, I invite all members, regardless of your current calling or level of activity in the Church, to obtain a copy of Preach My Gospel. It is available through our distribution centers and at no cost online. It is a guidebook for missionary work, which means it is a guidebook for all of us. Read it, study it, and then apply what you learn to help you understand how to bring souls to Christ through invitation and follow-up. As President Thomas S. Monson has said, now is the time for members and missionaries to come together, to work together, to labor in the Lord's vineyard, to bring souls unto Him. Jesus Christ taught His disciples the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. The Lord, Lord has answered that prayer in our day with the greatest number of full-time missionaries in the history of the world. In this new wave of faithful laborers, the Lord has given us another opportunity to assist Him in that great harvest of souls. There are practical ways for members to help and support our remarkable missionaries. For example, you can tell the missionaries that you're, you are studying Preach My Gospel and ask them to show you what they're learning in their studies. As you share with each other, increased confidence between members and full-time missionaries will surely develop, just as the Lord commanded. But that every man, and I include women, might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. And behold, I sent you out to testify and warn the people and it becometh every man who hath been warned to warn his neighbor. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine the impact if family and friends included things they're learning from their personal study of Preach My Gospel in their letters and emails to their full-time missionaries? Can you picture the blessings that will come to families when they know and understand better what their sons and daughters will be studying and teaching on their missions? Can you even begin to fathom the extraordinary outpouring of atoning grace that will be ours, individually and collectively, according to the Savior's promise to all who bear testimony in the process of inviting souls to come unto Him and then follow up on those invitations? Ye are blessed, the Lord said through the prophet Joseph, for the testimony which ye have borne is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon. 
and they rejoice over you, and your sins are forgiven you. For I will forgive you of your sins with this commandment, that you remain steadfast in bearing testimony to all the world of those things which are communicated unto you. If we follow up, the Lord will not let us down. I have seen the unspeakable joy that accompanies testimony-driven, inviting, and faithful follow-up among members of the Church the world over. While in Argentina recently, I encouraged members to invite someone to Church before this general conference. An eight-year-old by the name of Joshua listened and invited his best friend and his family to an open house at the ward in Buenos Aires. Let me read to you from a letter I just received that explained Joshua's invitation and his faithful follow-up. Quote, Every minute Joshua would run out to the gate to see if they were coming. He said that he knew they would come. The evening wore on, and Joshua's friend did not come. But Joshua did not give up. He faithfully checked the front gate every few minutes. It was time to start putting things away. When Joshua started to jump up and down, announcing, they're here, they're here, I looked up to see an entire family approaching the church Joshua ran out to greet them and hugged his friend. They all came in and seemed to enjoy the open house very much. They took some pamphlets and spent lots of time getting acquainted with some new friends. It was great to see the faith of this little boy and to know that primary children can be missionaries too." Close quote. It is my testimony that as we work together, seeking the One, inviting and following up with trust and faith, the Lord will smile upon us, and hundreds of thousands of God's children will find purpose and peace in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. May the Lord bless all of us in our efforts to hasten the work of salvation, I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Few feelings compare with the tender emotions of becoming a parent. There is nothing sweeter than receiving a precious baby direct from heaven. One of my brothers experienced this feeling in an especially poignant way. His first little son was born prematurely and weighed only 2 pounds 14 ounces. Hunter spent his first two months of life in the neonatal intensive care unit of the hospital. Those months were a tender time for all the family as we hoped and petitioned the Lord for his help. Little Hunter was so dependent, he struggled to gain the strength necessary to live. The strong hand of his loving father often reached for his son's tiny hand to encourage his vulnerable little child. And so it is for all of God's children. Our Father in Heaven reaches out for each of us with His infinite love. He has power over all things and desires to help us learn, grow, and return to Him. This defines our Father's purpose to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. As we develop greater faith and trust in the Lord, we can access His power to bless and deliver us. The Book of Mormon weaves this beautiful theme of the Lord's power to deliver His children throughout its pages. Nephi introduced it in the very first chapter of the book. In verse 20 we read, Behold, I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom He hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. Many years ago, I came to know in a very personal way 
just how near our Father in Heaven really is and just how much He desires to help us. One evening, as night was falling, I was driving with my children when I noticed a young boy walking along a road. After passing him, I had a distinct impression I should go back and help him. But worried it could frighten him to have a stranger pull up beside him at night, I continued driving. The strong impression came again with these words in my mind, Go help that boy. I drove back to him and asked, Do you need some help? I had a feeling I should help you. He turned towards us and with tears streaming down his cheeks said, Would you? I've been praying someone would help me. His prayer for help was answered with the inspiration that came to me. This experience of receiving such clear direction from the Spirit left an unforgettable imprint that is still in my heart. And now, after 25 years and through a tender mercy, I connected again with this boy for the first time just a few months ago. I discovered that the experience isn't just my story. It is his story, too. Derek Nance is now a father with a family of his own. He, too, has never forgotten this experience. It helped us lay a foundation of faith that God hears and answers our prayers. Both of us have used it to teach our children that God is watching over us. We are not alone. On that night, Derek had stayed after school for an activity and had missed the last bus. As a young teenager, he felt confident he could make it home, so he started walking. An hour and a half had passed as he walked the lonely road. Still miles from home and with no houses in sight, he was scared. In despair, he walked behind a pile of gravel, got down on his knees, and asked Heavenly Father for help. It was just minutes after Derek returned to the road that I stopped to provide the help he prayed for. And now, these many years later, Derek reflects, The Lord was mindful of me, a skinny, short-sighted boy. And despite everything else going on in the world, He was aware of my situation and loved me enough to send help. The Lord has answered my prayers many times since that abandoned roadside. His prayers aren't always as immediate and clear, but His awareness of me is just as evident today as it was that lonely night. Whenever the dark shadows of life blanket my world, I know He always has a plan to see me safely home again. As Derek expressed, not every prayer is answered so quickly. But truly, our Father knows us and hears the pleadings of our hearts. He accomplishes His miracles one prayer at a time, one person at a time. We can trust that He will help us not necessarily in the way we want, but in the way that will best help us to grow. Submitting our will to His may be difficult, but it is essential to becoming like Him and finding the peace He offers us. We can come to feel, as C.S. Lewis described, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. There are many accounts in the scriptures of those who have put their trust in the Lord and who have been helped and delivered by Him. Think of young David who escaped certain death at the hand of the mighty Goliath by relying on the Lord. Consider Nephi, whose pleadings to God in faith brought deliverance from his brothers who sought to take his life. Remember young Joseph Smith, who prayerfully sought the Lord's help. He was delivered from the power of darkness and received a miraculous answer. Each faced real and difficult challenges. Each acted in faith and put his trust in the Lord. Each received his help. And still in our day, God's power and love is manifest in the lives of his children. I have seen it recently in the lives of faith-filled saints in Zimbabwe and Botswana. In a testimony in a small branch, I was humbled and inspired by the testimonies shared by many children, youth, and adults alike. 
each conveyed a powerful expression of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. With challenges and difficult circumstances surrounding them, they live each day by putting their trust in God. They acknowledge His hand in their lives and often express it with the phrase, I am so much grateful to God. A few years ago, a faithful family exemplified for members of our ward that same trust in the Lord. Arne and Vanita Gatrell were living a happy life when Arne was diagnosed with an aggressive cancer. The prognosis was devastating. He had just a few weeks to live. The family wanted to be together one last time, so all the children gathered, some from distant locations. They had only 48 precious hours to spend together. The Gatrills chose carefully what mattered most to them. A family picture, a family dinner, and a session in the Salt Lake Temple. Vanita said, when we walked out of the temple doors, it was the last time we would ever be together in this life. But they left with the assurance that there is so much more for them than just this life. Because of sacred temple covenants, they have hope in God's promises. They can be together forever. The next two months were filled with blessings too numerous to recount. Arna Vanita's faith and trust in the Lord was growing, as evidenced in Vanita's words. I was carried. I learned that you can feel peace in the midst of turmoil. I knew the Lord was watching over us. If you trust in the Lord truly, you can overcome any of life's challenges. One of their daughters added, We watched our parents and saw their example. We saw their faith and how they handled it. I would never have asked for this trial, but I would never give it away. We were surrounded with God's love. Of course, Arndt's passing was not the outcome the Gatrills had hoped for. But their crisis was not a crisis of faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a checklist of things to do. Rather, it lives in our hearts. The gospel is not weight. It is wings. It carries us. It carried the Gatrels. They felt peace in the midst of the storm. They held fast to each other and to temple covenants they had made and kept. They grew in their ability to trust in the Lord and were strengthened by their faith in Jesus Christ and in His atoning power. Wherever we find ourselves on the path of discipleship, whatever our worries and challenges may be, we are not alone. You are not forgotten. Like Derek, the Saints of Africa, and the Gatrell family, we can choose to reach for God's hand in our need. We can face our challenges with prayer and trust in the Lord. And in the process, we become more like Him. Speaking to each of us, the Lord says, Fear not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I share my humble but certain witness that God our Father knows us personally and reaches out to help us. Through His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we may overcome the challenges of this world and be safely delivered home. May we have faith to trust in Him, I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The choir and congregation will now stand and join in singing, Teach Me to Walk in the Light. We will then be pleased to hear from Bishop Gary E. Stevenson, presiding bishop of the church. He will be followed by Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. At the conclusion of Elder Bednar's remarks, the choir will sing a child's prayer.
This is the 184th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The recent Olympic Winter Games enthralled the world as athletes representing 89 countries competed in 98 different events. Remarkably, 10 of these athletes were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, three of whom earned medals. Recently highlighted in the church news, Christopher Fote, Noel Picas Pace, and Tora Bright. We offer our congratulations to all of the athletes who competed. Well done. I speak of these games this morning, directing my thoughts to young men, young women, and young single adults, you who are in your critical years which set the course for your life. I feel a great sense of urgency in addressing you. For you to feel that urgency, I first share the story of Noel Picas Pace, one of those Latter-day Saint athletes. In Noel's event, The Skeleton, athletes build momentum as they sprint and then plunge headfirst on a small sled with their faces inches above the ground. They race down a winding, icy track at speeds that top 90 miles an hour. Remarkably, years of preparation would be considered either a success or a disappointment based on what happened in the space of four intense 60-second runs. Noelle's previous 2006 Olympic dreams were dashed when a terrible accident left her with a broken leg. In the 2010 Olympics, her dreams fell short again when just one-tenth of a second kept her from a medal stand. Can you imagine the anxiety she felt as she waited to begin her first run in the 2014 Olympics? Years of preparation would culminate in only a sliver of time, four minutes total. She spent years preparing for those four minutes and would spend a lifetime afterward reflecting on them. Noelle's final runs were virtually flawless. We will never forget her leap into the stands to embrace her family after crossing the finish line, exclaiming, we did it. Years of preparation had paid off. We saw her young women medallion around her neck as the silver medal was placed there beside it. It may seem unfair that Noelle's entire Olympic dreams hinged on what she did during just four brief minutes. But she knew it, and that is why she prepared so diligently. She sensed the magnitude, 
the urgency of her four minutes and what they would mean for the rest of her life. We also remember Christopher, Christopher Fote, a member of the team that won the bronze medal in the four-man bobsled race. While he could have given up after a devastating crash in the 2010 Olympics, he chose to persevere. After a fantastic redemptive run, he won the prize he so diligently sought. Now, consider how your pathway to eternal life is similar to these athletes' four-minute performance. You are an eternal being. Before you were born, you existed as a spirit. In the presence of a loving Heavenly Father, you trained and prepared to come to the earth for a brief moment and, well, perform. This life is your four minutes. While you are here, your actions will determine whether you win the prize of eternal life. The prophet Amulek described, this life is the time to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day to perform your labors. In a sense, your four minutes have already begun. The clock is ticking. The words of the Apostle Paul seem so fitting to run the race that you may obtain the prize. In the same way that certain steps are essential in the very brief performance of an Olympic athlete, jumps or maneuvers for ice skaters and snowboarders, negotiating the turns of a bobsled run or carving through the gates of a downhill slalom course, so it is in our lives where certain things are absolutely essential. Checkpoints which move us through our spiritual performance on earth. These spiritual markers are the essential God-given ordinances of the gospel. Baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, priesthood ordinations, temple ordinances, and partaking of the sacrament each week. In these ordinances, the power of godliness is manifest. And in the same way that the discipline of training prepares an athlete to perform elements in their sport at the highest level, keeping the commandments will qualify you to perform these saving ordinances. Do you sense the urgency? My young friends, wherever you are in your four-minute performance, I urge you to ponder, what do I need to do next to ensure my medal? Perhaps during this conference, the Spirit has whispered to you what that may be to prepare more thoughtfully for an ordinance in your future or to receive an ordinance that you should have received a long time ago. Whatever it may be, do it now. Don't wait. Your four minutes will pass quickly and you'll have eternity to think about what you did in this life. Self-discipline is needed. Daily prayer, scripture study, and church attendance must be the foundation of your training. A consistent pattern of obeying the commandments, keeping the covenants you have made, and following the standard, the Lord's standard found in for the strength of youth is required. Perhaps you're aware of things in your life that are threatening to slow or stop your spiritual progress. If so, follow Paul's counsel. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It is not yet too late to repent, but it soon may be, because no one really knows when your four minutes will be over. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, I already blew it. My four minutes are already a disaster. I may as well give up. If so, stop thinking that and never think it again. The miracle of the atonement can make up for imperfections in our performance. As Elder Tolland has taught, quote, to those of you who may still be hanging back, I testify of the renewing power of God's love and the miracle of His grace. It is never too late so long as the Master says there is time. Don't delay." Close quote. Remember, you're not alone. The Savior has promised that He will not leave you comfortless. You also have a family, friends, and leaders 
who are cheering you on. Although my remarks have been directed to the youth of the Church, for parents and grandparents I offer the following. Recently, Elder Bednar described a simple way to conduct a family assessment to mark progress on the covenant path for essential ordinances. All that is needed is a piece of paper with two columns, name and plan for next or needful ordinance. I did this recently, listing each family member. Among them, I noted an infant grandson soon to be blessed, a six-year-old grandson whose preparation for baptism was essential, and a son turning 18 whose preparation for priesthood and temple endowment was imminent. Everyone on the list needed the sacrament ordinance. This simple exercise assisted Lisa and me in fulfilling our role to help each member of our family along the covenant path with an action plan for each of them. Perhaps this is an idea for you, which will lead to family discussions, family home evening lessons, preparation, and even invitations for essential ordinances in your family. As a skier and snowboarder myself, I was deeply impressed with the four-minute silver medal winning performance of Australian LDS athlete, snowboarder Tara Bright, Tora Bright, in the halfpipe competition. She dazzled the world as she finished a virtually flawless run, culminating in a backside rodeo 720. However, however, even more impressive and surprising to the world was the way she reached out and demonstrated Christ-like love to her competitors. She noticed an American snowboarder, Kelly Clark, who had had a bad first run in her final round and appeared to be nervous about her second run. She gave me a hug, Clark recalls. She just held me until I actually calmed down enough and I slowed my breathing. It was good to have a hug from a friend. Kelly Clark would later join Tora on the winner's podium as a bronze medalist. When asked about this unusual act of kindness toward her, toward her opponent, which could have put her own silver medal at risk, Tora simply said, I am a competitor, I want to do my best, but I want my fellow competitors to do their best too. With that in mind, is there someone who needs your encouragement, a family member, a friend, a classmate, or fellow quorum member? How can you help them with their four minutes? Dear friends, you are in the midst of an exhilarating journey. In some ways, you are racing down the half pipe or sled track, and it can be challenging to perform each element or navigate each turn along the way. But remember, you've prepared for this for millennia. This is your moment to perform. This is your four minutes. The time is now. I express my utmost confidence in your abilities. You have the Savior of the world on your side. If you seek His help and follow His directions, how can you fail? I conclude with my testimony of the blessing we have in a living prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, and of Jesus Christ and of His role as our Savior and Redeemer. In His holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a dear friend who, in the early years of his marriage, was convinced he and his family needed a four-wheel drive pickup truck. His wife was sure that he did not need but merely wanted the new vehicle. A playful conversation between this husband and wife initiated their consideration of the advantages and disadvantages of such a purchase. Sweetheart, we need a four-wheel drive truck. She asked, why do you think we need a new truck? He answered her question with what he believed was the perfect response. What if we needed milk for our children in a terrible storm? And the only way I could get to the grocery store was in a pickup. His wife replied with a smile, if we buy a new truck, we won't have money for milk. <laughs> so why worry about getting to the store in an emergency? Over time, they continued to counsel together and ultimately decided to acquire the truck. 
Shortly after taking possession of the new vehicle, my friend wanted to demonstrate the utility of the truck and validate his reasoning for wanting to purchase it. So he decided he would cut and haul a supply of firewood for their home. It was in the autumn of the year, and snow already had fallen in the mountains where he intended to find wood. As he drove up the mountainside, the snow gradually became deeper and deeper. My friend recognized the slick road conditions presented a risk, but with great confidence in the new truck, he kept going. Sadly, my friend went too far along the snowy road. As he steered the truck off of the road at the place he had determined to cut wood, he got stuck. All four of the wheels on the new truck spun in the snow. He readily recognized that he did not know what to do to extricate himself from this dangerous situation. He was embarrassed and worried. My friend decided, well, I will not just sit here. He climbed out of the vehicle and started cutting wood. He completely filled the back of the truck with the heavy load. And then my friend determined he would try driving out of the snow one more time. As he put the pickup into gear and applied power, he started to inch forward. Slowly the truck moved out of the snow and back onto the road. He finally was free to go home, a happy and a humbled man. I pray for the assistance of the Holy Ghost as I now emphasize vital lessons that can be learned from this story about my friend, the truck, and the wood. It was the load. It was the load of wood that provided the traction necessary for him to get out of the snow, to get back on the road, and to move forward. It was the load that enabled him to return to his family and to his home. Brothers and sisters, each of us also carries a load. Our individual load is comprised of demands and opportunities, obligations and privileges, afflictions and blessings, and options and constraints. Two guiding questions can be helpful as we periodically and prayerfully assess our load. Is the load I am carrying producing the spiritual traction that will enable me to press forward with faith in Christ on the straight and narrow path and avoid getting stuck? Is the load I am carrying creating sufficient spiritual traction so I ultimately can return home to Heavenly Father? Sometimes we mistakenly may believe that happiness is the absence of a load. But bearing a load is a necessary and essential part of the plan of happiness. Because our individual load needs to generate spiritual traction, we should be careful to not haul around in our lives so many nice but unnecessary things that we are distracted and diverted from the things that truly matter most. The Savior said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke is a wooden beam normally used between a pair of oxen or other animals that enables them to pull together on a load. A yoke places animals side by side so they can move together in order to accomplish a task. Brothers and sisters, please consider the Lord's uniquely individual invitation to take my yoke upon you. Making and keeping sacred covenants yokes us to and with the Lord Jesus Christ. In essence, the Savior is beckoning us to rely upon and pull together with Him, even though our best efforts are not equal to and cannot be compared with His. As we trust in and pull our load with Him during the journey of mortality, 
truly, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We are not and never need be alone. We can press forward in our daily lives with heavenly help. Through the Savior's Atonement, we can receive capacity and strength beyond our own. As the Lord declared, therefore continue your journey and let your hearts rejoice. For behold and lo, I am with you even unto the end. Consider the example in the Book of Mormon as Amulon persecuted Alma and his people. The voice of the Lord came to these disciples in their afflictions. Lift up your heads and be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which ye have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. Now please note the centrality of covenants to the promise of deliverance. Covenants received and honored with integrity and ordinances performed by proper priesthood authority are necessary to receive all of the blessings made available through the Atonement of Jesus Christ. For in the ordinances of the priesthood, the power of godliness is manifest unto men and women in the flesh, including the blessings of the Atonement. Recall the Savior's statement, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, as we consider the next verse in the account of Alma and his people. And I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs. Many of us perhaps may assume this scripture is suggesting that a burden suddenly and permanently will be taken away. The next verse, however, describes how the burden was eased. And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them, that they could bear up their burdens with ease. And they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. The challenges and difficulties were not immediately removed from the people, but Alma and his followers were strengthened, and their increased capacity made the burdens lighter. These good people were empowered through the Atonement to act as agents and impact their circumstances. And in the strength of the Lord, Alma and his people were directed to safety in the land of Zarahemla. My beloved brothers and sisters, not only does the Atonement of Jesus Christ overcome the effects of the fall of Adam and make possible the remission of our individual sins and transgressions, but His Atonement also enables us to do good and become better in ways that stretch far beyond our mortal capacities. Most of us know that when we do things wrong and need help to overcome the effects of sin in our lives, the Savior has made it possible for us to become clean through His redeeming power. But do we also understand that the Atonement is for faithful men and women who are obedient, worthy, and conscientious, and who are striving to become better and serve more faithfully? I wonder if we fully acknowledge this strengthening aspect of the Atonement in our lives and mistakenly believe we must carry our load all alone through sheer grit, willpower, and discipline and with our obviously limited capacities. It is one thing to know that Jesus Christ came to the earth to die for us, but we also need to appreciate that the Lord desires through His Atonement and by the power of the Holy Ghost, to enliven us, not only to guide but also to strengthen and heal us. Alma explains why and how the Savior can enable us. And He shall go forth, suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And this that the word might be fulfilled which saith, he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. And he will take upon him death, 
that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people, and he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Thus, brothers and sisters, the Savior has suffered not just for our sins and iniquities, but also for our physical pains and anguish, our weaknesses and shortcomings, our fears and frustrations, our disappointments and discouragement, our regrets and remorse, our despair and desperation, the injustices and the inequities we experience, and the emotional distresses that beset us. There is no physical pain, no spiritual wound, no anguish of soul or heartache, no infirmity or weakness you or I ever confront in mortality that the Savior did not experience first. In a moment of weakness, we may cry out, no one knows what it is like. No one understands. But the Son of God perfectly knows and understands, for He has felt and borne our individual burdens. And because of His infinite and eternal sacrifice, He has perfect empathy and can extend to us His arm of mercy. He can reach out, touch, succor, heal, and strengthen us to be more than we could ever be and help us do that which we could never do, relying only upon our own power. Indeed, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. I invite you to study, pray, ponder, and strive to learn more about the Savior's Atonement as you assess your individual load. Many things about the Atonement we simply cannot comprehend with our mortal minds, but many aspects of the Atonement we can and need to understand. For my friend, the load of wood provided life-saving traction. The empty truck could not move through the snow, even equipped with four-wheel drive. A heavy load was necessary to produce traction. It was the load. It was the load that provided the traction that enabled my friend to get unstuck, to get back on the road, to press forward, and to return to his family. The unique burdens in each of our lives help us to rely upon the merits, mercy, and grace of the Holy Messiah. I testify and promise the Savior will help us to bear up our burdens with ease. As we are yoked with Him through sacred covenants and receive the enabling power of His Atonement in our lives, we increasingly will seek to understand and live according to His will. We also will pray for the strength to learn from, change, or accept our circumstances rather than praying relentlessly for God to change our circumstances according to our will. We will become agents who act rather than objects that are acted upon. We will be blessed with spiritual traction. May each of us do and become better through the Savior's Atonement. Today is April the 6th. We know by revelation that today is the actual and accurate date of the Savior's birth. April the 6th is also the day on which the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was organized. On this special and sacred Sabbath day, I declare my witness that Jesus the Christ is our Redeemer. I testify He lives and will cleanse, heal, guide, protect, and strengthen us. Of these things I joyfully testify in the sacred name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We are grateful to the choir for the beautiful music they have provided. We likewise extend appreciation to those who have spoken to us this morning. Our concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson. Following President Monson's remarks, the choir will sing, Guide us, O Thou Great Jehovah. And the benediction will be offered by Sister Neil F. Marriott, Second Counselor in the Young Women General Presidency. President Monson. My beloved brothers and sisters, when our Savior ministered among men, he was asked by the inquiring lawyer, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Matthew records that Jesus responded, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mark concludes the account with the Savior's statement, There is none other commandment greater than these. We cannot truly love God if we do not follow our fellow travelers on this mortal journey. Likewise, we cannot fully love our fellow man we do not love God, the Father of us all. The Apostle John tells us, This commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. We're all spirit children of our Heavenly Father, and as such are brothers and sisters. As we keep his truth in mind, Loving all of God's children will become easier. Actually, love is the very essence of the gospel, and Jesus Christ is our exemplar. His life was a legacy of love. The sick he healed, the downtrodden he lifted, the sinner he saved. At the end, the angry mob took his life. And yet, there rings from Golgotha's hill the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. A crowning expression of immortality, of compassion and love. There are many attributes which the manifestations of love, such as kindness, patience, selflessness, understanding, and forgiveness in all of our associations. These and other such attributes will help make evident the love in our hearts. Usually our love will be shown in our day-to-day -day interactions one with another. All important will be our ability to recognize someone's need and then to respond. I've always cherished the sentiment expressed in the short poem, I've wept in the night for the shortness of sight that to somebody's need made me blind, but I never have yet felt a tinge of regret for being a little too kind. I recently was made aware of a touching example of loving kindness, one that had unforeseen results. The year was 1933, when, because of the Great Depression, employment opportunities were scarce. The location was the eastern part of the United States. Arlene Wiesecker had just graduated from high school. After a lengthy search for employment, she was finally able to obtain work at a clothing mill as a seamstress. The mill workers were paid only for each of the correctly completed pieces they sold together daily. The more pieces they produced, the more they were paid. 
One day, shortly after starting at the mill, Arlene was faced with a procedure that had her confused and frustrated. She sat at her sewing machine out there, trying to unpick her unsuccessful attempt to complete the piece on which she was working. There seemed to be no one to help her, for all of the other seamstresses were hurrying to complete as many pieces as they could. Arlene felt helpless and hopeless. Quietly, she began to cry. Across from Arlene sat Bernice Rock. She was older and more experienced as a seamstress. Observing Arlene's distress, Bernice left her own work and went to Arlene's side, kindly giving her instruction and help. She stayed until Arlene gained confidence and was able to successfully complete the piece. Bernice then went back to her own machine, having missed the opportunity to complete as many pieces as she could have had. She not helped. With one act of loving kindness, Bernice and Arlene became lifelong friends. <laughs> Each eventually married and had children. Sometime in the 1950s, Bernice, who was a member of the Church, gave Arlene and her family a copy of the Book of Mormon. In 1960, Arlene and her husband and children were baptized members of the Church. Later, they were sealed in a holy temple of God. As a result of the compassion shown by Bernice, as she went out of her way to help one whom she didn't know, but who was in distress and needed assistance, countless individuals, both living and dead, now enjoy the saving ordinances of the gospel every day of our lives. We are given opportunities to show love and kindness to those around us. Said President Spencer W. Kimball, we must remember that those mortals we meet in parking lots, offices, elevators, and elsewhere are that portion of mankind God has given us to love and to serve. It will do us little good to speak of the general brotherhood of mankind if we cannot regard those who are all around us as our brothers and sisters." Close quote. Often our opportunities to show our love come unexpectedly. An example of such an opportunity appeared in the newspaper article on October, in October of 1981. So impressed was I with the love and compassion related therein that I kept the clipping in my files for over 30 years. The article indicates that an Alaska Airlines nonstop flight from Anchorage, Alaska to Seattle, Washington, a flight carrying 150 passengers, was diverted to a remote Alaskan town in order to transport a gravely injured child. The two-year-old boy had severed an artery in his arm when he fell on a piece of glass while playing near the home. The town was 450 miles south of Anchorage and was certainly not on the flight path. However, medics at the scene had sent out a frantic request for help, and so the flight was diverted to pick up the child and take him to Seattle so that he could be treated in a hospital. When the flight touched down near the remote town, medics informed the pilot that the boy was bleeding so badly he could not survive the flight to Seattle. A decision was made to fly another 200 miles out of the way to Juneau, Alaska. The nearest hospital in that city. After transporting the boy to Juneau, the flight headed for Seattle, now hours behind schedule. Not one passenger complained, even though most of them would miss appointments and connecting flights. In fact, as the minutes and hours ticked by, they took up a collection, raising a considerable sum for the boy and his family. As the flight was about to land in Seattle, the passengers broke into a chair 
when the pilot announced that he had received word by radio that the boy was going to be all right. To my mind come the words of the Scripture, Charity is the pure love of Christ, and whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Brothers and sisters, some of our greatest opportunities to demonstrate our love will be within the walls of our own homes. Love should be the very heart of family life, and yet sometimes it is not. There can be too much impatience, too much arguing, too many fights, too many tears. Lamented President Gordon B. Hinckley, and I quote, Why is it that the ones we love most become so frequently the targets of our harsh words? Why is it that we sometimes speak as if with daggers that cut to the quick? Close quote. The answer to these questions may be different for each of us, and yet the bottom line is that the reasons do not matter. If we would keep the commandment to love one another, we must treat each other with kindness and respect. Of course, there will be times when discipline needs to be meted out. Let us remember, however, the counsel found in the Doctrine and Covenants, namely, and when it is necessary for us to reprove another, we afterwards show forth an increase of love. I would hope that we would strive always to be considerate and to be sensitive to the thoughts and feelings and circumstances of those around us. Let us not demean or belittle. Rather, let us be compassionate and encouraging. We must be careful that we do not destroy another person's confidence to careless words of actions. Forgiveness should go hand in hand with love. In our families as well as with our friends, there can be hurt feelings and disagreements. Again, it doesn't really matter how small the issue was. It cannot and should not be left to canker, to fester, and ultimately to destroy. Blame keeps wounds open. Only forgiveness heals. A lovely lady who has since passed away visited with me one day and unexpectedly recounted some regrets. She spoke of an incident which had taken place many years earlier and involved a neighboring farmer, once a good friend, but with whom she and her husband had disagreed on multiple occasions. One day the farmer asked if he could take a shortcut across her property to reach his own acreage. At this point, she paused in her narrative to me and with a tremor in her voice said, Brother Monson, I didn't let him cross our property then or ever, but required him to take the long way around on foot to reach his property. I was wrong, and I regret it. He's gone now, but oh, I wish I could say to him, I'm so sorry. How I wish I had a second chance to be kind." Close quote. As I listened to her, there came to my mind the doleful observation of John Greenleaf Whittier, and I quote, of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these. It might have been, close quote. Brothers and sisters, as we treat others with love and kind consideration, we will avoid such regrets. Love is expressed in many recognizable ways. A smile, a wave, a kind comment, a compliment. Other expressions may be more subtle, such as showing interest in another's activities, teaching a principle with kindness, and patience, visiting one who is ill or homebound. These words and actions and many others can communicate love. Dale Carnegie, a well-known American author and lecturer, believed that each person has within himself or herself 
the power to increase the sum total of the world's happiness by giving a few words of sincere appreciation to someone who is lonely or discouraged. Said he, perhaps you will forget tomorrow the kind words you say today, but the recipient may cherish them over a lifetime." Close quote. May we begin now, this very day, to express love to all of God's children, whether they be our family members, our friends, mere acquaintances, or total strangers. As we arise each morning, let us determine to respond with love and kindness to whatever might come our way. Beyond comprehension, my brothers and sisters, is the love of God for us. Because of this love, He sent His Son, who loves us enough to give His life for us, that we might have eternal life. As we come to understand this incomparable gift, our hearts will be filled with love for our eternal Father, for our Savior, and for all mankind. That such may be so is my earnest prayer. Heavenly Father, I am glad that you're always here and there. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Our dear Father in heaven, we bow our heads before thee in gratitude for what we have heard and felt this day. We thank thee for the counsel we have just received from our beloved prophet. Help us and strengthen us to love thee more, to love each other more. We are grateful for the words of encouragement and faith about thy son's atonement. Our faith has been strengthened. We have had a deeper understanding taught to us this day of his atonement and the ordinances. We pray that we may go forth from this meeting, Father, with vigor and love and joy to build thy kingdom and to strengthen one another and be faithful to thee and thy son. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
This has been a broadcast of the 184th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>